The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, evil dies hard in the small town of Silence, Maine. We welcome a new fantasy hero from a grandmaster, and we saddle up once again and return to the weird Wild West for a final showdown. And when an ancient evil haunts Dust Bowl era Utah, who are you going to call? Not the Ghostbusters. That's right, Hiram Woolley, the cunning man himself, is back. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I'm Bain Consulting Editor David F. Shirerod. Today we're bringing you part one of my conversation with DJ Butler about the new novel, The Jupiter Knife, which is out now in trade paperback and ebook formats. Dave co-wrote the book with Aaron Michael Ritchie, and we'd hoped to have Aaron join us for the discussion, but unfortunately he was not able to make it. And while we definitely missed him, we still found much to talk about. The Jupiter Knife is full of twists, turns, and strange goings on, and it was a lot of fun talking to Dave about it. But first, the news. The February mass market paperbacks are in. First up, Breaking Silence by Mercedes Lackey and Cody Martin. Breaking Silence is the latest entry in the celebrated Serrated Edge series. The Blackthorns, dark elves who feed off misery, have been all but defeated by teenage Stacy and her friends, and the town of Silence is on the upswing. But the Blackthorns have not yet given up the fight. The soul of Silence is on the line, and it is up to Stacy and her friends to push back against the encroaching darkness. Next up is Penrick's Progress by Lois McMaster Bujold. Bain readers will no doubt be familiar with Bujold from her celebrated Vorkosigan saga. Now, welcome a new fantasy hero from this SFWA Grandmaster. Follow Penrick on his journey from noble young lord to sorcerer and scholar in the Bastard's Order. The mass market paperback edition of Penrick's Progress contains Penrick's Demon, Penrick and the Shaman, and Penrick's Fox. Three novellas by multiple award-winning, best-selling author Lois McMaster Bujold together for the first time. And finally, Bane wraps up its weird Western anthology trilogy with Straight out of Dodge City. It's the final showdown between heroes and darkness in the Old West. Humans versus monsters, supernatural beings versus greater evils, with a dinosaur or two thrown in for fun. Come explore the untold myths of the West with stories by Joe R. Lansdale, Mercedes Lackey, Harry Turtledove, Jonathan Mayberry, and more, but no dying on the trail. And that's it for the news. And now part one of my conversation with DJ Butler about The Jupiter Knife, which he co-wrote with Aaron Michael Ritchie. Hi, everybody. I am here with DJ Dave Butler. Uh, he is the co-author of The Jupiter Knife, as well as the earlier Hiram Woolley novel, The Cunning Man. Aaron Michael Ritchie, his co-author, uh, was going to be on with us today. But uh, as of when we started this recording, he hadn't been able to uh, get on for whatever reason. And uh, so we're just going to go ahead and start without him. And if he pops in, then it will be an extra surprise guest. Uh, I'm going to read Dave's uh, bio here uh, for those of you not familiar with him, and then we'll start talking about the Jupiter knife. So uh, DJ Butler grew up in swamps, deserts, and mountains. After messing around for years with the practice of law, he finally got serious and turned to his lifelong passion of storytelling. He now writes adventure stories for readers of all ages, plays guitar, and spends as much time as he can with his family. He's the author of City of the Saints, Rock Band Fights Evil, Space Eldritch and Kreshling from Wordfire Press, and the Witchy War series from Bain, which includes Witchy Eye, Witchy Winter, Witchy Kingdom, and Serpent Daughter, as well as In the Palace of Shadow and Joy, from, also from Bain Books. I already mentioned uh, The Cunning Man, and now this new novel, The Jupiter Knife, which I have got right here. 
Uh, Dave Butler is great to talk with you from, I'm in, uh, you can see in Utah and you are in outer space. So. And I'm in outter space. <laughs> yeah. Technology is marvelous. These days. Thank you. I, uh, the, wow, I feel like I have an oeuvre. The introduction is, is so, is so long now. So many books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, we're here. I, like I said, this is the new book, The Jupiter Knife. Um, the marvelous is, Dan Dos Santos cover. Yes. Uh, uh, these have amazing covers. Yes, I when we all oohed and odd when we saw those revealed at the Bain Road show, uh, whenever it was at Dragon Con. Um, they're great. Uh, he this is the second Hiram Woolley novel. Yes. Uh, the first one was The Cunning Man. I'm sure you probably talked to Tony about that when it came out. So we may be covering some of the same ground uh, again, no but I think that's, that's okay. Uh, so I read both of them this week. Uh, Cunning Man right. had been on my to read list for a long time, and I thought this is a perfect opportunity. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk about these with you. These are, um, I guess, let's talk about the genre of them first. They are sort of mysteries, sort of urban fantasy, but they're not very urban. Uh, so yeah. let, maybe set up where these take place and um, like I said, the genre of them and also tell us a little bit about the characters. Yeah, I, genre is interesting because I sometimes talk about them as urban fantasy. That's sort of the, the big genre they approximate most closely. I think occult detective is, yeah. a, is a closer match. Uh, you know, something like Manly Wade Wellman or some of the sort of Sherlock Holmes stories, not by uh, Conan Doyle, right? The, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes versus the Cathedral Mythos um, kind of thing. I had a, a really interesting reviewer write and say, Hiram Woolley, Hiram Woolley is the, uh, he's the photographic negative of Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is the man of science who raids other cultures for their sacred secrets. Uh, Hiram Woolley is a Jones-like figure in a few ways, right? And there's some Indiana Jones homages in his fedora. There's a bullwhip scene in, in yeah. book one that is absolutely an Indiana Jones <laughs> homage. Um, but he is the—he's the keeper of his own culture, sacred secrets, and and uh, and uh, and he's and and he brings value to the world with those things, rather than than uh, revealing them to the world or putting them in museums. Which I thought was an interesting way yeah. to talk. About it. So uh, these books are set in 1935, a year which it turns out. So I have to tell you, writing book two, I learned that astrology is true. Okay. Uh, part, of, <laughs> part of my learning that was realizing that we had inadvertently chosen a year which has the maximum number of eclipses that the Earth can experience in it, oh, which wow. is five solar and two lunar eclipses. Not only that, but we accidentally set book one during the weekend of a solar eclipse, which we didn't know. So fortunately, we have it snowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and we and we and the weekend we chose to put book two in uh, also turned out to have another solar eclipse in it. Wow. So um, yes, uh, 1935. So the protagonist is Hiram Woolley. He was uh, he he's the abandoned son of a polygamist father. So he's raised by his mother who disappears mysteriously, and then he's raised by his grandma Hetty mm -hmm. on her sugar beet farm. He's a sugar beet farmer in Utah in 1935. And in 1935, he's in his 40s. And his, he's a widower. Grandma Hetty is long gone. He owns the farm. And he has an adopted uh, Navajo son. Uh, Hiram uh, fought in World War I. He was led to do so by visions, uh, where he uh, encountered a, a Navajo, became friends with a, with a Navajo man, Yaz Yazzie, who went for similar reasons. Um, and when Yaz died in the trenches, uh, Hiram promised he'd, he'd raise his son. And so uh, Hiram's adopted son, Michael, is uh, where, where Hiram is. So Hiram's a farmer. Hetty taught him to farm. She also taught him her traditional magical lore. So, uh, so he's, a, he's a keeper of, uh, of secrets in a time of great transition, uh, right? In fact, he's a one, one way to think about him, there are many ways to think about him as a character, but he is a guy who stands across uh, multiple thresholds. Um, he belongs to past and future worlds, to male and female worlds, to secular and religious worlds, to magical and scientific worlds at the same time. And uh, so he, uh, his son on the other hand uh, is uh, in book one, aggressively materialist, scientific and progressive. 
Um, and uh, so part of Hiram's inner tension, so what Hiram does is uh, fight evil. He fights evil uh, with his magical lore on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the poor, the widows, uh, the widows and the fatherless, right? This is religion pure and undefined. So, um, but he, he, he feels like he's losing Michael, his son. And so he keeps secret from him. There's already tension over the fact that Hiram believes in God and Michael aggressively does not. So Hiram for sure keeps secret the fact from his son that he is still practicing Grandma Hetty's crafts. He's a practicing magician. Um, although that's not, a, that's not a word Hiram would use. Hiram, uh, when pressed, uh, well, when asked, he simply denies, I'm, I'm not a wizard, I'm not a soothsayer, uh, I'm just a guy who knows what works. When he's pressed, he'll say, you know, uh, Grandma Hetty said of herself that she was a cunning woman, I guess that makes me a cunning man, which is, which is, a, which is an, an actual English uh, medieval and early modern term for a, a kind of practitioner uh, of magic. So, um, so yeah, so Hiram's a farmer who goes about fighting the magical demonic evils of the Great Depression using his grandma's magical lore with his adopted son's sidekick uh, who will grow up to be a scientist or a high-powered lawyer or something like that. So um, that's, that's kind of, that's the setting uh, and, uh, and, and, and Hiram. Yeah, um, I definitely want to talk about because I think one of the main themes and one of the things there's a, I, I always feel like, I, you know, I'm an English major. I always feel like I make these things so English major. You know, we want to talk about like the bullwhip scene or what about when he stabbed the guy. I always make these like, let's talk about the theme, you know, but I think the theme is what enriches this beyond just sort of a, what would otherwise be still a great story and a great action-packed mystery. But the theme, since you brought it up a little bit, of this science and and religion or science and um materialism versus the immaterial supernatural world i think is a theme that really runs through both books especially this one because um you know as you say he keeps a secret from michael um but michael by the end of the first book has he's sort of indiana jones at the end of raiders or something right even though you can't really deny anymore you know you it's you can't really deny it anymore you know you're, he keeps trying to and i to me that was like we'll we'll talk about the plot in a minute but the thing that really made these books um special is this idea of um the old ways i'm going to read a quote i read you your you or aaron's writing i don't know who wrote this passage but um do, do, do let me find it um this is from towards the end of the book but it doesn't no spoilers or anything uh if all mystery disappeared if all the old ways vanished what would be left science and logic only could they explain a man's life give him comfort in this time of need nourishment for his soul Hiram wasn't sure I think you know he like you say he straddles these lines of this these old ways and the new ways and you even have within his church he's at conflict with sort of the new um maybe progressive as we think of it today isn't the right term but you know progressive ideas of the church and um i i don't know i want to talk about that more i thought that was an interesting that like i said that to me deepened the story of of and in the fact that you personified in michael who is his son but he wants the best for you, you don't want to be a beet farmer like me you you can do better things with your life but this sadness that he's also losing the old ways um, yeah and it's not that he's um i, I mean Hiram doesn't have politics as we think of them right? yeah I mean, if anything he's he's always respectful of president roosevelt mm -hmm. uh and, and um the he's not he's not a foe of modernity mm -hmm. um but he's always conscious that there is a cost and there is something that you lose yeah. so uh so in book one there's a there's a debate um in a, over a couple of conversations uh, about labor legislation, because one of the one of the characters is one of the characters who appears briefly as if she might be a love interest, and then she disappears. Because one of my favorite things is that there are no 
no real romantic subplots in these books. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, she's she like Michael is a real firebrand, and 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 you know, uh, and Hi- Hiram hears her. She hears his line, which I stole from Dwight Yoakam uh about uh you know and Hiram's kind of putting up some resistance saying you know I'm not really sure we should tell minors how to do their business I mean when you say that a a kid can't work with his father if they're if I couldn't have Michael's help in the farm there'd be times when I just couldn't get it done Mm -hmm. you know and that's true for these minors true too and she says you know um you know have you ever seen a 16 year old lie down on the on the floor and roll back and forth to loosen the phlegm in his lungs enough that he can spit up all the black coal dust right which is a line i took from dwight yoakam talking about his one of his uncles and his boyhood in kentucky so um you know Hi- hiram's not he, he wants michael to go you're, you're right be a scientist right or be a lawyer or be something else but there's always a price uh it's never as easy as black and white so Hiram's this guy who carries uh, a kind of a kind of sadness a kind of like you know he's he's reflective um about the changes that are happening around him and uh and and where we're going and what and what we lose yeah yeah and I think that's um a thing I want to talk about. I think in the book, you sort of begin to address this a little bit. There, there is this weird. Maybe we're getting too deep for a talk about the the you know. But we'll we'll have whatever. We're gonna go with it. There's this idea that science and religion, or science and whatever, are at war with each other, and maybe that's true. And then, but there's an idea that maybe they are not, or they don't have to be. Um, and you know, Michael says like. And actually, maybe this can segue into another topic I liked about the books, which is he says, you know what magic and science have in common, things don't work the way you think they would. And um, maybe we could, we'll talk about that. And then I also want to segue in with that quote to the other thing, which is that I know you have spoken against, maybe that's too harsh a word, but it's your preference, maybe hard magic and magic. And uh, the thing I liked about this is there's so much ambiguity in a good way, I thought, of, ha- you know, the way the the magic works in this. So you've said all the magic in this is real. Yeah, as close um, as we can get it. So talk about, let's talk about that. Let's let's move into that and, and why this isn't hard magic and what your problems, what's your problem with hard magic, Dave? And uh, how is this book different in that regard? Are these books? So the problem with with hard magic, um, and because I am an arco libertarian, I would not ban hard magic even if I were king. But here's why <laughs> I don't like it. Here's why, I, you know, I read I read the Mistborn trilogy. I was like, cool. And then I read the first of whatever the next series. I was like, oh, it's the same thing. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's it's ba- it's a lie. The problem yeah. with hard magic is is it's a lie. Um, Real magic is, um, you use the word ambiguity, it's a good word. It's notoriously difficult to pin down what is magic and what is not. And there's a, there's a voluminous literature of anthropologists and psychologists and historians writing a, 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 about, what, well, where is the line? On which side of this line is science? Um, magic, uh, sorry, gravity, for example. Gravity was denounced as a magical idea when Newton proposed it. It was occult action at a distance. He said, things cause each other to move. Uh, I can't tell you why, but it does. Uh, mm-hmm. And his opponents said, aha, that's a cult. <laughs> and they were not wrong. Yeah. They were wrong. So, uh, you know, what's magic? What's science? What's religion? And what is magic? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the whole word, magic is it comes from a greek word magia which literally means what the magoi do and the magoi are persian priests they're the they're the men who come to find baby jesus in chapter two of the gospel of matthew so uh literally our word magic where it comes from is the religion of those other people Mm -hmm. uh and anthropologically that's often uh that's that's historically often the case that that we we call what we do religion Mm -hmm. But that guy crosses himself wrong and he's what praying to the saints and right. whatever he did with that chicken, that's sorcery. <laughs> uh, and uh, and if my if my religion doesn't work, I'll go talk to my 
uh, often it's a class issue too. I'll talk to my servant and I'll consult his dark, you know, witch gods and try and get an answer. Um, there, there's also, there's psychological writing about magic in terms of uh, exploring magic as the idea of this is, uh, 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 this is human reaction. It's, it's what happens when you're a human soul with the ordinary human kind of uh, psychological archetypes built into its psyche. It's how we respond to crisis or it's how I try to assert my will over a disordered universe, right? Now, now the thing about all of these different ideas of magic is they lie really close to the human condition. Mm -hmm. They are, they are, they are about society. They are about your mind and your heart. They are about your relationship with God. Magic has to do with all of that stuff. Actual magic as people practice it in the real world and try to understand it. Hard magic sweeps all that away and says, okay, let me pick something schematic, a list of 10 metals, the visible colors of the color spectrum, uh, whatever, bullcrap thing, calories, uh, and uh, different kinds of fabric. Uh, and, I will, uh, and I will make a, uh, you know, a schematic mm -hmm. that says, oh, plastic wizards can do this, metal wizards can do that, airbenders, whatever. So look, that's fine if you want that. At that point, it's pure adventure fiction. You're no longer, you, you've taken out of fantasy literature that piece of it that lies extra close, super close to the human spirit. So that by nature, what fantasy literature should be is the what if literature of, of human spirituality and you've taken that out and you're not really writing true fantasy anymore. Yeah. You're writing adventure, st adventure stories with superheroes or with science fiction type made up rules on a made up world. And that's fine. It's just not fantasy anymore. And you've denatured it. You've yeah. given up its birthright. Yeah. And I think, I think about, I guess walk me through it. Uh, Cause Hiram does carry, he carries a bloodstone and it, so in a way, I guess, I guess, for those of us, maybe it's me, um, just to follow you a little bit better. How is a bloodstone that can do what it does? It, it, it helps him determine if people are lying. It can bring him fame, uh, various things. How is that different from- it Cause uh, rain. Yeah. What's it? It brings rain. Yeah. It stanches okay. the flow of blood, prevents him from being deceived. Yeah. Well, I didn't make any of that up in the first instance. Well, there you go, yeah. Uh, so um, in the real world, um, in kind of the European late medieval Renaissance period, magic got codified. This is, this is Renaissance courtly kind of magic. And um, actually lean back off of that. Let me back off of that. Look, he, he, that's like a whole other conversation we may get to. Um, but that's not how Hiram practices. He's not Renaissance courtly magic. He's not really book magic. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's traditional lore magic. So the okay. answer is as simple as his grandma had, he said, certain stones have certain properties. You want to always carry a bloodstone. Mm -hmm. By the way, J. Pierpont Morgan carried a bloodstone. Okay. Yes. By the way... Brigham Young carried a bloodstone. Right. This, and this we should is, say this is not in your book. This is IRL, as the kids say, right? This is IRL. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you read JP Morgan's biography, the dude carried a bloodstone. Yeah. So, uh, which is a, it's a heliotropius. It's a little green speckled stone. If you go, okay, well, you're in, you're in Moab. Whoops. You just lose me. Oh, no, I can hear you. I see your handsome author photo. Dead. Okay. Um, <laughs> So if you drive down into Moab, 20 miles from where you Oh, now I lost you. Ah. Are you hearing me? Now I'm hearing you, but I'm still not seeing you. You're still not seeing me. Yeah. Um, Okay, let me let me rewind. At least at least you can hear me with my at least my still picture is a picture of me. Yes. Um, so so the, the bottom line is that uh, that that certain stones are believed to have uh, certain powers. 
And, and to you or to me, those may appear to be utterly random associations. Why would the same stone, a little not especially precious uh, green speckled stone, uh, bring rain, prevent deception, and stanch the flow of blood and cause fame? That's like, a, that's like a random grab bag of stuff, but that's some of the traditional lore. By the way, when you start writing books in which you describe some of these ideas, in a non-judgmental way, and you talk about them in a non-judgmental way, people come forward and say things like, I have a review on Amazon that says, there are numerous practices of both my mother and father described in this book, mm -hmm. right? I, I have a woman in Texas came forward, wanted to have lunch and said, let me tell you about my stone magic. And she started showing me all her stones and what they do, right? Mm -hmm. so, so Hiram's magic is not made up, almost all of it, comes out of uh, the uh, what we're really one of two places the English cunning man tradition um, which a lot of academic work has been done on that in the last 30 or 40 years uh, about the sociology of these people who they were there there's a book uh, there's uh, let's see what's his name it's called the grimoire of Arthur I want to say Arthur Lancelot that can't be right um, but there's a, a, a 16th century cunning man's grimoire that's been published in its entirety just here's a facsimile of the of the grimoire mm -hmm. this guy had um and um the other main source for what Hiram does is is german but it's extremely american um as as you probably you know uh, the great invisible ethnic group in the united states is german there's like a hundred million americans with german ancestry including me um but of course, it became deeply uncool to be German a couple of times in the 20th century. For some so, reason, I can't put my finger on. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so people, uh, they, they're really Americanized by and large. Right. Um, so uh, but the biggest selling uh, magical grimoire written in America, the, the, the best selling magic book uh, of American uh, occult. Uh, is is German. It's called The Long Lost Friend or Four Begorna Freund or something by John George Homan. Uh, and it's a uh, book of the about the, uh, the, the, the Brauker, the Braukerei, the, the German active praying tradition. And uh, that is so American um, that, uh, that we included it. So Hiram doesn't have really books of spells. He's got, he's got things he learned from his grandma, but, the, but where the things he's learned from his grandma come from tends to be these grimoires of the cunning man or of, of, of the cunning man or, or uh, Homan's book um, or uh, you know some 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 closely related sources uh, including oh shoot now I'm forgetting the title of it the discovery of witchcraft by Sir Reginald Scott yeah I think you quote that in the front of one of oh yeah here we go the first I do this book, book too yeah yeah, yeah. So the discovery of witchcraft is a fantastic book. Reginald Scott is an Elizabethan uh, country gentleman from Kent. And he's a lawyer and he has a career doing kind of county offices, you know, and he writes two books. And the first one uh, is uh, he advocates bringing hops into England to make beer with. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other book is the discovery of witchcraft. And, and the point of the discovery of witchcraft, it's a super fascinating book, because the point of it is he says, listen, you got to stop persecuting witches. All you're really doing is you rich men, when some old woman gets in your way, you accuse her of being a witch. And the book is this long description of all of, the, of, of, all of this uh, of proceedings against witches and claims that witches do. And, and what he says is, uh, you know, I'm ridiculing this. There's no such thing as magic. That's complete nonsense. But he records in great detail what people do and what they're believed to have done so that the book becomes a kind of a spell book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the one magic book Hiram has ever said to have read. As a doughboy, he's in London briefly. He gets into a library. He copies this whole thing down. Um, and, uh, and other than that, what he knows is... So here's the point. We've said many words. What he knows is traditional magical lore that exists in the real world. And he mostly knows it through what his grandma told him. Right.
uh okay so let's see we were talking about magic um yeah so hard magic is fine it's childish it loses the power of magic yeah um let's talk about let's talk about let's keep going with this magic theme because or maybe with this theme i don't know uh the thing that is also interesting you mentioned indiana jones who is like my favorite hero of all time probably and especially in raiders of course and the thing with him in i'm going to give my quick indiana jones thesis statement which is that raiders is the outlier not temple of doom or crystal skull those three are actually more of a piece than Raiders. Raiders is actually the oddball. No one else believes me, but Christopher Rocchio agrees with me on this. No, no, I think, so let me stay, let me continue your thesis. Okay. Because you've said this, I'm now quoting you back to you. Oh, story. okay. <laughs> because Raiders is an homage to the 30s pulps. Mm -hmm. Two, three, and four are homages to Raiders. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I, they, I agree with that. Um, but the thing about Raiders uh, with the characters, he's much rougher edges. He's not quite an, he's probably an anti-hero. But the thing I like about, you said he's a negative in a way, or the reviewer did, of Hiram Woolley is a negative in Indiana Jones, is that Hiram Woolley is not an anti-hero in any way. I, and I find that refreshing. You know, I, I was talking about this with my father-in-law, um, who's a big reader and science fiction fantasy fan. And, um, you know, I was, was reminded of Alan Moore, you know, who kind of gets blamed rightly for a lot of the anti-hero stuff, but he was like, the problem is that the anti-heroes work when there's mostly heroes and they have something to contrast. We've become so mired in anti-heroes that they've lost, they're just jerks. It's all that they are. They're just terrible people who do terrible things. They're not really even anti-heroes anymore. So it was nice to see Hiram Woolley as a just a hero. Um, and he's not to say he doesn't have faults. He's got many faults and he has doubts. And but he's not, he is a person who is a godly person and who takes things seriously and tries to help where he can. And so that was a refreshing thing to me. And it was also interesting um, to see then how here he is. I think, you know, you said helping the, the widows and the poor, orphans and widows and the poor. And yet he runs afoul of the church in a way um, by doing that in the yes. book. I don't know, just maybe talk about that a little bit. It, yeah. And it's not a huge theme, but it does come out, you know. It's, it, and it's an ongoing theme. Yeah. So, and it connects back to some of our earlier conversation too. So another way to think about Hiram is to say, um, he's an answer to the question, okay, what might a paladin, like a D and D style paladin look like mm -hmm. in 1935? A guy who is a, a fighter, uh, who's also a holy man and has a kind of crusade. What does that look like? Not in a, not in a crazy 1935, but in a recognizable yeah. 1935. And, and the answer is, higher. I think my answer is, is higher more. He is self-sacrificing. Um, he he would take a lot of abuse from, from people. Uh, and he's, you know, he's slow to anger uh, in response. And, and he really, he's not out for his own wealth at any point. And he really wants to do right by the poor. Now, so uh, one of the transitions, so, so, so 1935, this period is, is liminal. It's a period of transition in many, many ways, right? Uh, the government's getting a lot bigger. We're, we're, we're starting to regulate things we never regulated before. Mm -hmm. um, you got uh, a national news media, uh, you know, coming in. Um, there are also some, some transitions that are actually pretty specific to Hiram's Mormon background. So, for example, the fact that he's born in a polygamist in, uh, family when it's fairly common in 1891 or whatever, um, but by 1935, it's definitely illegal, and people are on the lam in Mexico and Canada for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but another piece is, it just so happens that uh, that uh, the Mormon church is, is reinventing itself in the period 1910 through 1940. Um, and they're trying to uh, become more American. Hey, we're more like you. We're not those crazy people our grandparents were. Here in the desert, yeah. 
here out in the desert <laughs> with seven wives and and right and the Danites and 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 whatever. Um, so uh, so so generically, Hiram has enough foot in the in the old world to sort of run into conflicts in the new. Uh, and so and so there are people who like him grew up in the world where women uh, healed by the laying on of hands and people practice glossolalia and uh, and you know had a much more magical worldview. Uh, and now in 1935 I really want to get sort of be much more scientific. Um, and, and real specifically um, 1936. Uh, so one of the things that the LDS Church does very well is its welfare system. We 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 get a lot of good press for this, and and we should, because it's because it's it puts decision making power really close to where the need is, helps to avoid sort of long term dependency uh, without getting it. And there's no there's no overhead. There's no government bureaucracy, right? Um, all of that starts being invented in the year 1936. Uh, and it's invented, uh, this, you did not imagine it was going this direction, a little Mormon history lesson for you. So uh, in the depression starts, first half of the thirties, uh, you get local leaders experimenting on their own, trying to figure out how do we keep people fed? How do we get people, you know, work with dignity so they're not sitting around being fed by their neighbors, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a little kind of federal, you know, there's people allowed to experiment locally. In 1936, the church says, well, we're going to start to roll this out. And it eventually becomes, you know, what, what it is today. So Hiram's on the, on the far side. He's, he's right before that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so there is a coming movement towards bureaucratization and standardization uh, in what he does, helping the poor. He is a guy who's willing to just get in the truck and drive a load of food. Uh, he hears there's a guy needs a well dug. He's going to go dig the well, right? Uh, and uh, and so so even like in his leadership, there are people who see him as remnants of a barbaric and witchcraft obsessed past, uh, and who want to replace him and what he does, even the, even what they value of what he does, with a more efficient, a more organizational kind of attitude. And so he's sort of a he's sort of a reminder uh, of a of a past that we that we want to get rid of in a couple mm -hmm. of ways. So so we have these two characters, uh, and uh, these are actually uh, real men, Smith and Wells, are real guys. They're in Wikipedia. You can find them. <laughs> uh, they're the first and second counselor in what is called the presiding bishopric, which is. I don't know some readers are like checking out now. They're like, I right, would turn off. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like the the group in the LDS Church that manages physical stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. they manage the welfare system. They they exist today. I mean, these individuals don't, but this right. function exists. They they manage property. They manage the corporations. Okay, uh, so um, these, these are real guys, the, the first and second counselor, the number two and number three guy in this group in 1935. Um, and we've set them up like the good sergeant and the bad lieutenant mm -hmm. in a police procedural. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, you, you, you read or you watch a, 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 you know, a, a police uh, procedural detective story where the good hearted but maybe slightly out of bounds hero cop has a bad lieutenant who wants him fired, who wants him busted, who wants him probation, says, give me your badge, give me your gun, and a good sergeant who's always trying to stick up for him and run interference, right? And so we've set that up in the form of these two guys. And the, the story opens with this conversation between the bad lieutenant who's threatening excommunication and man, you're in trouble and you're off the reservation and I've heard bad things about you. You're performing magic, aren't you? Aren't you a sorcerer? And then the good sergeant who's like, hey, now, you know, he's, uh, he's doing good work. We need somebody uh, to, to try and keep Hiram in play. Yeah, and I liked how he kind of, uh, throughout the book, he sort of like wants to keep everything on the DL because he doesn't want, you know, he has this good heart uh, he doesn't, he's not doing this for his own glory, but also because he doesn't want to get in trouble. And the, the bloodstone is kind of 
thwarting him in that it can bring fame. And so he's like, you know, I need this thing, but it's, you know, it's messing him up. Uh, I guess let's, um, it's fascinating, you know, it's interesting. I'm, this is probably out of bounds for this, but it's fascinating because I've been reading some Wendell Berry stuff about you know, culture and agriculture and how this sort of like very neatly talk. It, it was weird to pick up this book and be like, Dave Butler's writing about this too, but there's a wizard, you know, um, you know, and these old ways of doing things. And, and, you know, I think it's important that Hiram is a farmer and that there was a, a different kind of understanding. And maybe this is what we talk about a little bit, what we talk about when we talk about magic of natural rhythms and the earth versus sort of the, and you're talking about this with 36 coming in with the bureau, bureaucracy and efficiency and mapping, it kind of in a way ties into what we're talking about with hard magic, mapping everything down. So it's in little boxes and explain versus the sort of messy uh, world, which you can know in other ways. And I think that was, I think uh, was interesting to me is the, the conversation between him and Michael Michael wants everything to be scientific method and materialism. And Hiram is kind of saying that stuff's fine and good. And, but it's also, there are other ways of knowing things as well. Um, so. And now we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Salarian League. For hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization, but the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has worn the star kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Salarian League and hell is riding in her wake. Cargo container HNL 1007-9-463H. Freight hub number seven, Bay 16 Beta, Beowulf Gamma, Beowulf system. The cargo container had been parked in its storage slot two local days after it had been dropped off. It had been there ever since, waiting for a representative of Stickle and Lyman, one of Beowulf's larger manufacturers of small craft and shuttles, to collect it. The manifest chip listed its contents as an Archon 3 cargo shuttle's fusion bottle, which explained its large size and mass. And obviously, it was exactly the sort of shipment Stickle and Lyman might expect or, for that matter, be sending to someone else. The only problem was that Stickle and Lyman had never heard of it, and the SNL tracking number in the manifest chip was completely bogus. In fact, it contained a laser-pumped nuclear bomb. The security scans had missed it entirely, exactly as the people who'd actually shipped it had expected. It wouldn't have been readily detectable as a weapon under any circumstances, since it contained no radioactive elements and the fusing lasers were a legitimate part of the shuttle power plant. The power supply and the actual hydrogen pellet were concealed inside the bottle itself, and the bottle's walls had blocked the scanning systems. And so it had sat there, waiting to be claimed by someone who didn't even know it existed. Harold Simmons Gilchrist listened to the cheering all around him and tried not to spit on the deck. His instructions had been unambiguous, but his control hadn't told him, or hadn't been able to tell him, perhaps, exactly when the Sollies would get around to attacking, and he'd been away from his station at the critical moment. There'd always been a possibility, a probability, really, of that happening. But Simmons Gilchrist was the third shift cargo master for the Beowulf Gamma Habitat's number seven freight hub. It would have taken someone pretty damn senior to get in his way when he insisted on reporting for duty in the face of such an unanticipated emergency. It was just his misfortune that it had taken over an hour for him to physically get here, which meant he hadn't been able to send the signal at the moment he was supposed to. His control had been emphatic that it would be far better to transmit it 
while Sally missiles were actually flying. But she also said there was at least a little flex in the timing. He reminded himself of that now, as he unlocked the number pad on his console and entered the second of the long, complicated commands he'd been given. The one he'd been told to use if he couldn't transmit until after the Sally's attack had ended. He'd been placed in Beowulf over 40 T years ago, and despite the excitement of knowing the Detweiler plan had finally been launched, his had been a terminally boring assignment. He was confident the intelligence data he sent up the line was valuable, but he doubted it was of earth-shaking importance. And he'd come to the conclusion that he was one of the countless agents who'd spend their entire careers on the periphery. Valuable, dedicated, conscientious, and with damn all to show for it at the end of the day. So he'd felt an undeniable surge of adrenaline when his control told him he'd been activated as a vital component of a major operation. She hadn't told him what that operation was, although the fact that it was supposed to coordinate with a Sali attack on the system, assuming the Sollies ever got off their arses and launched the damn thing, had underscored its importance. He had no idea what his transmission would accomplish, but whatever it was, he was pretty damn sure the Beowulfers around him would never forget it. Even if they never knew he was the one who'd done it, whatever the hell it was. He entered the last digit of the code and looked down at his panel for a moment, wondering if he should abort his part of the operation, since he hadn't been able to execute it as the missiles attacked, after all. He was tempted, despite the second code he'd been given. Whatever happened when he sent it, the Grand Alliance was unlikely to blame it on the Sollies, and hadn't that been the purpose of the entire operation? But he didn't know if all the missiles out there had attacked yet, now did he? The System Defense Force might know, but he didn't. And if there was another attack inbound, and he aborted his part of the operation? His nostrils flared as he inhaled deeply, and then he shrugged. Wiser heads with far more information than he could possess had come up with the plan, and they had given him the second code. All he could do was the best he could do. And, he admitted to himself, there was another reason. If he'd been brought operational for a moment that let him contribute to the Detweiler plan on the grand stage, he was damned if he was going to miss it. He smiled at that thought and hit the transmit button. Cargo container HNL 1007 9 463H received the command and implemented it. 27 seconds later, Beowulf Gamma, the third largest orbital habitat in the Beowulf system, ceased to exist, along with 9.5 million human beings, including a Mason Gamma line named Harold Simmons Gilchrist. That was another entry in David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Jedkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to DJ Butler for discussing his novel, The Jupiter Knife, with me. The Jupiter Knife, once again, was co-written with Aaron Michael Ritchie, and we were sorry we missed him this time. Thanks as always to Tony Daniel for letting me sit in this week while he ran some errands. You know, he said he was gonna swing by the grocery store on the way back, and uh, but I noticed it looked like he left his list here. Uh, here, I'll read it aloud to you. Pound pastrami, can kraut, six bagels, bring home for Emma. Seems like it might be important. Let me take a picture of it right quick and text it to him. All right, that's taken care of. Until next time, I'm David F. Shirod coming to you live from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>